Hello again. Uh, we're back in uh, Business 140, Chapter 12, Investing in Stocks and Bonds, online with Professor Jolene. Uh, a new my, new form of delivery for me and that sort of thing. I uh, hope we're kind of getting into this and kind of enjoying it. We've done we've done uh, we've done chapter nine. We've done chapter ten. Those were in the chapters where we finished up insurance and talked about the importance of insurance and making sure that we don't lose our wealth and that sort of thing. Chapter eleven is a, is the first chapter in investing, and I put this over here for us kind of investing between our timeline and our wealth line because a lot of the ways that you can increase your wealth is through investing. And so I also threw a couple of other things up here on the board that we covered, uh, I guess, in the, uh, in the last chapter as we started the investing section. Uh, remember, we're investing as personal financial planners. We're not speculating. We should have a written investment plan. There's different ways to invest. You can do it with mutual funds, you can do it with stocks, you can do it with bonds. You can, I guess, invest in CDs or savings accounts, although those are, are low, low rates of return. We talked about bull and bear markets. We've been a very, a very optimistic bull market and almost overnight, kind of probably the first time this ever has happened, we've plunged into a pretty deep, or, or maybe not deep, but certainly into a bear market, a, a market that's pessimistic. And remember the thing about the stock market. The one thing that drives the stock market crazy is uncertainty, and that's what we're in right now. We talked about the, the mixture of investments that you have is your portfolio. And good people, that people that work in this all the time say, you need to diversify your portfolio. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Okay, we're going to be primarily talking about investing in stocks and bonds in chapter 12. And that chapter is going to be the last chapter before test number 3. So 9, 10, 11, and 12, then we'll do test number 3. Now here's what he says. I'm just going to kind of read off of my, my handout a couple of things as we get started. Most rational investors are motivated to buy or sell securities based on its expected or anticipated return. Buy if it looks good, sell if it doesn't. I mean, that's the idea about investing. What you're trying to do is increase your wealth, increase your investments. But he says, when you're thinking about investing, when you're thinking about investments, remember this, you always have to be thinking about risk. These two things go together. You can't forget risk. If, if you, generally speaking, if you invest in something that will provide you a higher rate of interest, it's going to be somewhat riskier than if you invest in something that has a lower rate of interest. Now, what's too risky? Well, that depends. Some people that's pretty conservative like me, it doesn't take a whole lot where I start getting nervous. Other people that are more, a little more adventuresome, they may take a little le you know, higher level of risk. But the main thing is when you're doing personal financial planning, you always want to stay in bounds as far as what's a, an acceptable risk for you to take. Okay, I started off this chapter, and I don't want to scare you away from investing, especially in stocks, but I want to talk about, you know, when we said, you know, there's risk that's involved with this. Well, let's talk a little bit about risk. Now, stocks are ownership in companies. So you could go out and buy stocks or ownership in CenturyLink. Or you could go out and buy stock or ownership in Walmart. So stocks are ownership. Okay, what are some kind of some risk that could be involved with purchasing stock? And I've listed about four or five of them here on your, on your uh, paper for you. But I want to pick up just a couple. Business risk. Business risk means the, the risk that the company you bought stock in is going to continue to have earnings, is going to continue to make a profit. The risk that the business has itself just by simply being in business. Financial risk. Businesses have to be really, really careful that, that the debt that they incur is not greater than the equity that they have within their company. So if, if, you're, if your debt gets too high in a company, it, it, it can create problems as far as people investing with that company. That's called financial risk. And event risk. Now, we, let me give you the, I mean, a brand new example of that, coronavirus. This event alone over the last month 
maybe even less than that in the United States, uh, this event has caused panic within our stock and, with our, and within our entire securities market. So sometimes events that happen can be really substantial risk. Okay, well, let's, I, I want you, by the way, I'd like for you to be familiar with that first couple of things that I set up here. If you're looking at your, at your, your document, most rational investors are motivated to buy and sell based on its expected return. I'm going to buy and I'm going to sell based on what return I think I'm going to receive. But remember, risk is always there with you too. So, so never invest without thinking about the, the risk potential of that in investment. And then uh, the talks about the risk of investing. I'd be familiar with things like business risk, financial risk, event risk. Okay, so if I'm going to invest, what do I expect to get? Or what are some of the returns from investing? Um, I don't think this is so clearly laid out on your handout. I don't think I will put it up on the whiteboard unless I jump up and change my mind. But this is something I want you to know. What what are what are the returns that you get from investing? The first one is current income. Well, I better jump up and write on the whiteboard. Let's say if you're investing in stock or you're investing in bonds, and we're going to talk about how this works in a, in a few minutes, but you can get funds, you will get money you can receive from stocks or bonds, you can receive dividends. You can take those dividends when you get them and you can put them in your checking account. They can be yours. That would be current income. Uh, you, may, you may invest in a number of stocks. Those stocks are, all, you know, are, are historically known for paying dividends. So you can increase your current monthly income through the year by investing in, in, uh, in investments that pay dividends or pay some type of amount out to you that you can use for living. Capital gain. Now let me, let me show us what capital gain is. Primarily we're thinking about stocks when we think about capital gains. You buy a stock and you buy that stock for $20. You keep that stock for a year and you sell it for $30. You've made $10 on that stock. That's a capital gain. So one way you can, you can receive money is income that comes off of your investments. Your investment pays you a certain amount of income periodically. Another way that you can make money off of your investment or returns from investing is capital gains. The third way you can see here is what's called interest on interest. A lot of people will tell you when you invest, Whenever that, whenever that investment instrument, whatever it is, whenever it makes money, don't take that money out. Don't put it in your bank account. But whatever that is, leave that money in that investment. Uh, and that way, the interest you're earning, you're going to be earning interest on it. So does that kind of make sense? That's the idea. Is uh, uh, Dividends, if you get a dividend, buy more stock and then you can earn interest on interest. The risk return trade-off. This is another way of saying what we said. Oh, by the way, again, I want you to know the three returns from investing. That's why people invest. Interest on interest, capital gain, current income. The universal rule of investing means that if you want a higher level of return, you'll probably have to accept greater exposure to risk. So again, the, the, the higher the income, the higher the risk. If anybody is uh, out there and you're, you're watching uh, me do this video and you can say, now, Professor Lane, I know an, a, 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 an investment that you can do right now you can earn 10% interest on it, and it's, it's virtually risk-free. You have my phone number. Give me a call and tell me what it is that I need to do. And I'll make sure that I can invest everything I can find. If it's a guaranteed 10%, because those things just don't happen. In this day and time in 2020, there's very few things that you can guarantee a 10% rate of return on anything uh, without it being pretty doggone risky. Okay, 
Uh, another thing that I put on the handout, I, I, I want to stay fairly close to this. I, I want you to be familiar with that universal rule of investing. We kind of mentioned it up at the top of this. This is just kind of another way of restating it. One more time, sort of saying it again, the value of any investment depends on the amount of return it's expected to provide relative to the amount of perceived risk involved. It's a, it's a proceeds amount of return versus risk. I think our author said that about three different ways. Okay, investing in common stock. Now, we've already said what stock is, Stock is ownership in a company. We talked about the securities market last time. What happens is, if companies want to raise, you know, why would a company sell stock? Because they need income. They need revenue. Income's the wrong word. They need revenue. Uh, they, they're maybe going to do a, a new expansion, or they're going to do something else that requires a good bit of, of money. Well, they may not want to borrow that money. They may sell additional scares of stock. And when you buy that stock, then that puts additional money into that, into that uh, uh, company that they can use to do whatever those things that they want to do. Remember now, stock is ownership. You are an owner. They call you a residual owner. What that really means is that you are an owner and you do own shares of stock or part of ownership in the company, but your, your ownership takes place after everything, every other debts and everything are solved or are taken care of. So the debts of a corporation have to, be, have to be taken care of before you would receive anything from the ownership. Something else about owning, you can vote. Common, common stockholders can vote stockholder meetings, things about, you know, going back to probably the first five or six chapters, we know corporations have a board of directors. The board of directors are elected by the stockholders, and so, and they, they set broad policy and procedure for companies. So as a, a stockholder, an owner, you can vote in stockholder meetings. Now, if you only have one share of stock, you're not going to have much clout, but you can, uh, you can still do that. And I've already mentioned that two ways that you can make money from stock ownership is to buy it at 20, sell it at 30, you have a $10 capital gain. The other way is that periodically, if that company is doing well, they will pay a dividend or an amount of money per share of stock. So they may say, we're going to pay $1 a share for every share of stock that you have. So if you have $100, you'll get a check for $100, which will be a dividend from that company. Uh, normally, when companies do well, they like to share that, that profit, that wealth, with their owners or their stockholders. And they do that by paying them dividends. So that's the way you can, you can receive uh, income from stock. Okay. Stock, you have voting rights, you're a residual owner. Just looking at my handout, again, it, it pays dividends. Um, types of stock. Uh, we talked about when, when we mentioned the Dow, the fact that uh, the, the way that the professionals try to track the market is they have, pick, they have picked 30 blue chip stocks and they watch how those 30 blue chip stocks are moving. That's called the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So you can buy blue chip stocks, you can buy technology stocks, growth stocks. There's all different kinds of stocks out there that are, that are available. So that's a little, bit about, a little bit about stocks. Now, what I want you to be familiar with, I want you to be familiar with the fact that stocks do have, oh, you are an owner. I want you to be familiar with what dividends are. And I'd like for you to be familiar with the fact that stocks do have voting rights. Now, what are some of the advantages, I, as, as I'm looking at this, I'm kind of flipping this over to the, the back side of my, my notes for this chapter. What are some advantages of stock? Returns can be substantial. Man, you can make some really good capital gains with stocks. If you hit it just right. But, but let me caution you. Remember, I'm always talking about when you can make, 
uh, you can make returns from stocks. You always got to keep that risk in mind. When I told you that you bought that stock for 20 and you sold it for 30 and you made $10, what if you had a thousand shares of that? Boy, that'd be great. But let's make sure we understand something. Does that stock automatically going to go to $30? It may not. What if that stock after you bought it at 20 went down to $18 and stayed there for a while? Well, you probably would not want to sell it because you would take a capital loss of $2 unless you thought that company was going to go down the drain, then you'd probably try to sell it and cut your losses. So just remember, although you can make substantial, as it says here, substantial returns, you can have substantial losses because there is risk. Uh, secondly, as far as advantages, highly liquid. You can buy and sell stocks anytime you want to, and you don't have any management to do. I mean, you're, you're, not, you're not involved in the management of the company or anything like that. And if you have a stockbroker, as we talked about in the last uh, uh, chapter, that stockbroker can help you as far as making decisions. The disadvantages of stocks, there's a certain amount of risk and there's a certain amount of uncertainty. Okay, but that stocks, ownership, capital gains, dividends, it's a great way to invest. Personally, uh, if you're, you know, unless you really want to dedicate yourself to studying the stock market, uh, I would certainly use a stock broker if I was going to handle it with stocks. Bonds. Now bonds are, are a lot different than stocks. A company may sell bonds. I'm going to draw us a bond up here. A company may sell a bond. The ABC company sells a bond, a $10,000 bond. So that means people buy that bond. This may be an ABC company and they're selling that bond and they're, they're selling it and they're going to pay you 4% interest if you buy it. Okay. So they have this bond and they say, okay, we need to sell some of these bonds. What for? The same reason you sell stocks. They need to raise funds to do something or other with their company. Uh, if it's to keep their company from going under, you probably don't want to buy those bonds or buy those stocks. But as far as the expansion or things like that. So you buy this bond. Now you buy an ownership. No. On a bond, a, a bond is an IOU. The company is basically giving you an IOU note. If you look what I said, bonds are liabilities, they're publicly traded IOUs. This company is saying, if you'll buy this bond from me for $10,000, and this bond may be a 20-year bond. Let's make it a 20-year bond. We will give you, after 20 years, we'll give you back your, your $10,000 plus we'll pay you interest on your money. Okay. So, whereas stocks are ownership, bonds are debt of the company. They have to repay them. They have to pay them back. And bonds have attached to them little coupons. They're almost like a little tear-off, and they're called coupons. And, and this is the way you receive your interest. Normally, bonds will have six months coupons on them. And you simply take that six month, what did I say, it was a 4% interest rate? You simply take that six month coupon off and it, literally you can just tear it off and redeem it. So you don't have to wait 20 years to get your interest. That interest is paid probably semi-annually through the 20 years that you have the bond. So that's what coupons are. I, I'd be familiar with what bonds are. Bonds are debt. Bonds are IOUs of the company. We'll, we want your money. We give you these bonds. Uh, at the end of the 20 years, we give you your $20,000 back or $10,000 back and we pay you interest through the 20 year period of time. So I want you to be familiar with what bonds are, I want you to be familiar with what coupons are. Okay, uh, bonds, I'm just looking at my hand out to kind of see where I wanted to, to, to go with this. Who can sell bonds? Uh, Businesses can sell bonds, government can sell bonds, school boards can sell bonds, uh, a number of different folks like that can sell bonds. Where do you go to sell bonds? Same place you go to sell stocks, the securities market or the securities exchange. And so you can invest, and you can invest, now you can, you can almost think bonds 
are bonds a safer investment than stocks? The answer would be yes. Because you, you're guaranteed an amount of money, 4%. So they're a safer investment. Which do you think has the potential to earn you more income? Stocks or bonds? Stocks. Because you could hit a really high capital gain, they could pay you some pretty good dividends, and you could make more, generally speaking, in your investment in your stock is going to yield more than in a bond. But it's riskier. It might not. It might not. And now another question I get asked sometimes is, okay, all right, I understand this is a debt, but what if the business goes belly up? Could I lose all my money there too? Well, it's possible, but not highly likely. And here's why. Whenever a business goes belly up, it has certain assets. It has certain value. What's going to happen to the assets of that business? Those assets are going to be sold. And then they're going to pay off as many of the debtors of that business as they can. As a matter of fact, if you happen to own stock in that business, and that business went belly up, you're probably going to lose your stock. But if you had a bond in that business, uh, you had bought a bond from that business, uh, when they say, okay, we've got money here to pay all the debtors off, all you debtors get in line, the very first folks in line to get paid are going to be bondholders. They have first claims to, the, to the, uh, the liquidated assets of that company. So they're pretty doggone safe even if the company goes under. Now, can you buy some bonds sometimes that are highly speculative? In other words, it's a company that's, that's putting out bonds, but that company's kind of shaky. Or it may be in a new field or something that's kind of a shaky field. Well, the answer is yes. And what may happen, that this company, this would be the, uh, the, the Joe Lane Shady Deal Company. And I may have to give 10% interest to get you to buy my $10,000 bond. But when you look at that, you know, you're thinking, you know, if that company survives and pays me 10%, that's gonna be, that's gonna be great. But the chances are that company or that industry may not survive at all. So I'm kind of, I'm almost like speculating here. We said, you know, don't invest, don't, don't speculate, make sure you invest. If you get into some bonds that are too crazy, that are too speculative, uh, you, have a chance of, you have a chance of losing. Those bonds are called junk bonds. Let me, let me go over and, and check, uh, so it's kind of in a good spot here. Let me look at chapter 12. Uh, stocks and bonds, we talked about business risk, uncertainty from firms earnings, financial risk, having to do with the debt and equity event risk. An event, the risk that some major unexpected event will occur that leads to a sudden substantial change in the value of an investment. Wow, like I said, we've got that all over the place now with this coronavirus. Hopefully those investments will come back. Uh, the returns from investing, something we need to know. <coughs> we talked about that. We've talked a lot about you have to, you have to balance out return with risk. You have to be comfortable with the risk that you have versus your expected return. We did a pretty good job of talking about that. Uh, we said that you were an owner as a stockholder. Uh, stockholders of the company, they're entitled to dividend income and share of the company's profit only after the firm's other obligations have been met. So you're not gonna get those, uh, those things unless the other obligations of that company has been met as a residual owner or a stockholder. And you do have voting rights. So we've done pretty good, I think, of, of chatting about some of the things that we, we wanted to. Up to this point, I just kind of wanted to take the time out and see if we were, see if we were, uh, we were okay. And I think we, uh, I think we are. We talked about what a coupon is, a bond feature that defines the annual interest income the issuer will pay, and that was to be familiar with, be familiar with as well. Um, oh, one thing I didn't mention to you, and I think I had it on the handout. The bond market is huge. Bond, outstanding bonds back when this book was written, and that's several years ago, was over $35, $36 trillion. So the bond market is a huge, huge market. Okay. Um, 
I'd be familiar with the fact that this is a this one thing that really stands out about the bond market is its size. The U.S. bond market is huge and getting more huger. Well, I didn't exactly say that. Uh, almost daily, thirty. Well, I said now it's almost thirty-nine trillion dollars. Wow. Uh, we talked about where you you know who can sell bonds, uh, school boards, uh, cities. Police juries, parishes, counties, um, and of course, uh, the, the largest seller of bonds are our companies. Junk bond, also known as a high yield bonds, these are highly speculative securities that have received low ratings from Moody's and Standard and Poor's. Now, wait a minute. What's this about low ratings from Moody's and Standard and Poor's? And again, I don't want to go too deep with this, but, but I want us to get a little bit of feel about stock and a little bit of feel about bonds. If your company, if Walmart were to sell bonds, would they have much trouble selling a bond? No. I mean, they're, they're the most powerful retailer in the world. So Walmart could sell bonds and they would be pretty well accepted. What if another company, the ABC company, was trying to sell bonds? And they're really a good company. They're a good company, but they're not well known. So the ABC company wants to sell bonds. But, but again, or in our case, when I was used to be with the Washington Parish School Board, the Washington Parish School Board would get a vote from the people to sell bonds. And so we bought us, I think the last issue I was involved in, I think it was about a $60 million issue. And we get a call every once in a while and they want to talk to somebody at the Ochita Parish School Board. Well, that meant that was probably somebody from somewhere else in the United States that didn't have a clue about us, but wanted to know something about our bond sale. And you sell bonds, you know, all, all these folks sell bonds on the securities market. But what the point I'm making here is if you're not very well known, people may not be, may not be quite so eager to buy your bonds. So you can get a report card done on your bonds. And the two companies that do that, and they're in New York, is a company called Moody's, and the other company is called Standard & Poor's. And their job is they evaluate a company. They rate a company in every possible different way. The strength of the company, uh, the financial strength, do they have any lawsuits against them, what kind of a atmosphere are they in, what does their future look like. They, they, they spend an enormous amount of time finding out everything in the world about you that they possibly can. And, and when they do that, then they give your bonds a rating. Uh, we usually, we usually use Moody's for our ratings. And so getting ratings on a bond is like getting a report card on the bond. Now, if you've got crummy, if, you, if, you're, if your company is not very good, and you're just hoping and praying you can sell these bonds, you don't want to get them rated. Because if they get a bad rated by, rating by Standard and Poor's or Moody's, they're not going to sell. But like the Washington Fair School Board, we knew we were financially strong. But we knew not everybody in the nation knew us. So we got our bonds rated, and what that did, that allowed us to get to sell the bonds and sell the bonds at a good interest rate, a good interest rate for the, for the school system. Okay. Probably more than you need to know about that, but anyway. Uh, I think the only other thing, I want you to be familiar with bond ratings, kind of what they are and why you do them. I want you to be familiar with the, the two companies that do most of the bond ratings are Moody's and Standard & Poor's. And I want you to kind of be familiar with what junk bonds are, highly speculative bonds. The last thing I see on the back side of this page are premium and discount bonds. Okay. Now this is, this will be a, this will be a be familiar with, but I'd like for you for at least to have a little feeling for what a premium lost my marker, what a premium and a, uh, a discount bond is. All right, here's a bond. This is ABC Company again. It's a 20-year bond. And the bond rate, it's a $10,000 bond. And the rate of interest they're going to pay is 4%. Now, let's say that the going rate in the market the going rate in the marketplace for investments is 2.5%. So that means if you go out and generally try to buy an investment right now, you're probably going to get something like about 2.5%. This thing pays 4%. 
That means this is a premium bond. What does that mean? You could actually sell that bond for more than $10,000. You could sell that bond on the securities market for more than $10,000 because the rates it pay in is greater than the market rate. Now, I'll do this in red or green, the color I have closest. Let's say that the 4% is, is the rate on this bond. The market rate right now, the rate in the market is 6%. Is, is 6 That's higher than the rate, the rating of the, the that the bond has. That would make this a discount bond. If you wanted to sell this bond, you couldn't get $10,000 for it because it's only paying 4%, but people get 6% it's going right on the market. So that could be a discount bond. So sometimes you'll hear the term a premium bond or a discount bond. What that means is simply the rate of interest that that bond is paying versus the market, the going market rate. I believe that's most of the things that we need to cover in, uh, in chapter 12. There's other things in there about investing, but I think these are the, probably the most important things. I guess, uh, why invest in bonds? Because you can get current income off of bonds, you know, pulling those, pu those coupons. Uh, and uh, they're, they're stable. They're stable. They're, they're less risky than stock. But generally speaking, your earnings on bonds are going to be less than that of stock. All right. We have done chapters 9 and 10, which had to do with insurance, health insurance, property insurance, liability insurance, and we've done chapters 11 and 12. Chapter 11 just kind of introduced us to investing. In chapter 12, we talked specifically about stocks and bonds. I think we've gone through and done a pretty good, pretty good job with those, and then what we're, what we're going to do is, now test number 3 will take 9, 10, 11, and 12. And so we'll be taking that test probably the first part of April, and then uh, we'll we'll have uh, we'll have my notes will be uh, will be uh, uh, in Canvas my and that, that I have, and also uh, these videos for each one of the uh, the chapters will be in Canvas as well. So you can study, you can have my notes, you can study. Uh, and be ready then when test number three comes along. Now remember this, we're kind of in, we're kind of in strange times right now. So remember, it's old, if you need to contact me, call me, text me, or email me if you have any concerns or anything like that, because it's gonna take us a little while to get kind of lined out, but if you've got my, and you know when things are gonna happen because you have my contract document in Canvas. You've got my chapter notes in Canvas, and you've got these videos in Canvas. So I'm, I'm trying to do my part to get things lined up really good for you. You do your part to use those things and do a, a great job on test number three. Now, as I've told you before, uh, Professor Pierce says I always have to have some sort of a louder audio uh, so that it, that it will spike so that he knows, knows that I am through with the chapter. So we are through with chapter 12 and we are through with those chapters that's going to take us through test number three. So we'll do these, we'll do a test number three, and on the other side of that, we'll get back together in these videos with chapter 13. So we are bringing chapter 12 to an end. Thank you.